Hi and welcome to the Financial Fox, a special show today as we are joined by the famous Ageless and one of the UK most successful and uh, popular investors and entrepreneur, Jim Mellon. How are you, Jim? Very well, Steffi. Very happy to be with you. Thank you, Jim. So I would like to pick up your brain on a few topics today and also on some investment trend. I mean, you are a well-recognized market guru. So uh, at the moment, you are focused on the, lo on the longevity sector, which uh, you basically said is going to be the next big money fountain. Would you like maybe to explain a little bit about the journey and how uh, have you got uh, to this point and, you know, about your conclusion? Okay. Well, it's taken me about a year to research and to write this book, which just recently came out, as you know, Jim in Essence. And I'm pleased to say the book is almost sold out, so we're going to have to reprint it, so that's great. Um, which is the first time ever for one of my books. That it, but I suppose everyone's interested in living longer, so in that sense it's... It's a, a fantastic book. Well, it's very easy to sell something about, you mm. know, living for a very long life. Um, I was triggered about this by the fact that we are the first people on the planet to be able to manipulate our molecular biology in order to extend life. If you think about it, when your grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were alive, their life expectancy was cut short by a lack of proper sanitation, proper diet, they had to work very hard in factories where there was a lot of accidents, they didn't have antibiotics, and it's the same for my family as well. Today, all those factors have been overcome, largely in the developed world, but also now in the developing world. So today, we are able to change our fundamental insides, if you want to put it that way, in order to prolong life. And it's been demonstrated in animals that life extension is possible by as much as 60 or 70 percent, in other organisms by maybe 10 times, by using chemical and genetic engineering means to extend life. So I was really intrigued by that. And of course, I've been working in biotech for the last 10 years, as you know. And uh, this is a natural outgrowth of biotech, except it's going to be become the biggest part of biotech. But you think that everybody wants to live together? I mean, it, it looks like a great idea, but at the same time, it could be quite disruptive because, you know, it's going to throw up some ethical question of quite a big impact on the society. It's definitely true. I mean, I think that uh, there are several factors to this. One is that can you live in a healthy state a very long life, or do you, are you going to be old for a very long period of time? And the answer is that we hope that using these new drugs and techniques, that people will be what we call um, worldly as opposed to elderly. So they'll live in a robust state, almost to the point where they die, at 110 or 120, rather than being in a nursing home and being burdened by illness and inflammation and disease. That's the first point. The second point is that it, the world will change dramatically because there'll be many more older people, amongst them myself, of course, and a lot yes, less young people because the fertility rate of women has declined very sharply in the developed world, so much so that there are not enough children being born to replace the people who are dying. So the population of the world, at least in the developed world, is going to plateau and then go down. And the preponderance of older people relative to young people will be quite dramatic in the next mm -hmm. 30 years, which leads us to the third point, which is how can we pay for all this, yeah. right? I don't think healthcare is so much the issue. The issue is pensions and life insurance, all right? They are unsustainable if people think they're going to retire at 65 and they live to 110 or 120. So pensions are going to have to go out to 85, 90 years, and they're going to have to happen quickly. The governments think it's going to be 68 or 70. That's not possible. So these people in France and Italy who retire at 40 or 45 or 50 and then yeah. are going to have another 70 years of life, it's just not possible. So everything about our financial services is going to have to change, and it will change very quickly. All of this is happening at the same time when technology is accelerating. We have automation, we have artificial intelligence. So people are going to be changing their jobs at the same time as they're getting older. So it's going to be very disruptive, very difficult for society to deal with, but it's going to happen. And if you in Italy or we in the UK say, 
we're going to stop progress. Someone in China will be carrying on with progress. Someone in even North Korea or in, or in Japan will be carrying on. So we can't stop progress. We have to accept it and we have to embrace it. There's, no, there's nothing we can do about it. But let's maybe comment a little bit on the global scale. I mean, is going to be this uh, life extension, is going to be just a prerogative of the highly developed countries and only for rich and famous? I mean, how the government, for instance, the US, should close the gap between highly developed developed country and less developed countries? Well, there's no particular reason that the US would do that, especially with President Trump, who thinks of America first and no one else, basically. But the fact of the matter is that uh, these drugs and techniques no normally only last for about 10 years in their patent life. So since this is a long-term project, by the time that we're all able to take these drugs, they'll probably be generic, they'll probably be very, very cheap, and they'll be accessible to people in the developing world as well as the developed world. I'm not concerned about a gap between rich and poor being able to afford these techniques, except for genetic engineering and stem cells, which will remain very expensive because they're very complex uh, mechanisms. But things like drugs will be relatively cheap for everyone around the world. More importantly, is health inequality at a fundamental level. So in the United States, for instance, 40 million people still don't have health insurance. A lot of people don't have access to proper education. Uh, and as a result, they eat the wrong things. They don't do any exercise. You have a very high rate of obesity. 38% of the US population is obese. It's the highest rate in the world. Mm -hmm. That's just in the United States. In the developing world, some of the Western habits, bad food, lack of exercise, are now being yeah, adopted. Uh, and, and of course, in China, diabetes is now a very big problem. 12% mm -hmm. of the population is diabetic. So um, I'm more, from an ethical point of view, I'm not so concerned about the affordability of these techniques. I'm more concerned about the fundamental basis of health inequality. Let's talk a little bit about uh, um, our longevity portfolio. I mean, mm -hmm. the longevity industry is uh, still in a very early stage. So you have a mainly private company and just a very few pure play public company. I mean, do you have any investable company that you would like to recommend to our investor? And also, how long is it going to take before investor can see some returns? Well, the problem with longevity is that the research can't be done over a very long period of time because the companies can't afford to do that. And of course, the researchers live just as long as you and I. So if if I say I've got a drug that's going to keep you alive for an extra 50 years, we could be waiting around for 70, 80, 90 years, basically, to see if it works. So we can't make claims yet about longevity. But what we can do is develop drugs that are related to longevity and which we think extend human life, but make more specific claims for them. So, for instance, a disease that's related to old people like osteoporosis may be cured by a senolytic drug, as an example. Or the fact that old people above the age of 75, the flu injection doesn't work very well for them, but it works better when they take a rapalog, a rapamycin analog, uh, and Novartis is making that, for instance. If that works, then you can make a specific claim so you can get the drug to the market faster. So the investments that we're making and other companies are making are designed to make a specific claim that's related to age, but is not saying you're going to live another 50 years as a result of that. Those claims will come later on. But you're right, there are not many companies that you can invest in. Those com many of the companies that are out there that are public are not worth investing in. They're a bit of a scam or they're not really very good. But I could say... Biotime, which has a very good subsidiary called Ajax, which will be spun off this year, is a very interesting company. Cobar, C-O-H-B-A-R, is also very interesting. PureTech here in the UK, which has got a subsidiary called Restore Bio, they're all interesting, and they're at the smaller end of the spectrum, more speculative, but I would say that they're worth looking at from an investment point of view. And at the big end of the spectrum, GlaxoSmithKline is very interested in ageing, and, of course, Novartis is the world leader among the big companies in anti-aging research. And Novartis is a very good company, and it's relatively cheap. It's got a dividend yield, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my portfolio I'd recommend to your listeners or your viewers. Um, but fundamentally, you have to wait for some of these private companies to come public, including mm -hmm. ours. 
Okay, yeah. so if we move from the longevity sector to uh, more like energy and technology sector, I would like to get your views on the lithium and the cobalt, given all the buzz around electric cars. I mean, what do you think about the lithium? And also, do you have any specific companies that you think investors should have on the, you know, on the watch list? Mm. Well, I'm very interested in lithium because Although there have been, there's been plenty of talk about it and a lot of buzz in the stock market, there are still not very many good quality investable companies for people to invest in. And the lithium market, although it has been somewhat hyped, is still way behind the curve of what the reality of the electric vehicle and energy storage business is going to be. So if you think about it, JP Morgan said last year $1 billion of lithium carbonate was sold in the world. In 2030, which is only 12 or 13 years uh, away, $50 billion of lithium carbonate will be sold in the world, if not three or four times more than that. So there's going to be a, dis, uh, a, a, a nexus between the fact that there's not enough lithium uh, and the demand is going way beyond what people could possibly have thought. And as a result, I think the lithium price will treble sometime in the next three years. One example of that is that the mega factory, which you're familiar with in Nevada for mm -hmm. uh, Tesla, will consume all the lithium produced in the world in its first uh, full year of production, which is a year and a half away. That's all the lithium. And yet mega factories are being built in China, Japan, and elsewhere in the world. So something has to happen. So uh, we have identified, we have, we have 10 tenements uh, in North America and also one in Australia. And the company that you can invest in now which is the joint venture company with our own company, Brad Ahead, um, is called Zenith Minerals, and it's listed in Australia. And it looks really good to me, and they had a very good discovery today, which they announced. So yeah. I think it looks very exciting. Okay, so looking forward for uh, Brad Ahead, the news flow. Uh, the last things, blockchain and Bitcoin. I mean, we saw they, they seem to be one of the next big things. Bitcoin, you know, is over uh, eleven thousand dollars today. And I mean, what uh, what's your view on that? Well, there's a difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. Blockchain is the mechanism by which Bitcoin is transmitted around the world, and it's a ledger. And blockchain can be used for multiple things. It can be used for banking, accounting, computing, whatever you want. And actually, there's lots of applications in blockchain. Bitcoin, to be quite honest, I don't understand why it's so expensive, why it's gone up so much. And actually, one thing it has done is drawn speculative attention away from gold. Because we're in an era of easy money, there's too much surplus cash out there. The governments are beginning to taper a bit, but you would normally have at this period of rising inflation, and you'd normally have gold at $1,500 or $2,000 an ounce, but everyone's focused, although speculators are going to Bitcoin instead. So Bitcoin is now capitalized at 200 billion US dollars, which yeah, is a which very is large amount. And uh, as far as I can see, it's basically a mechanism for people to avoid paying taxes, to smuggle drugs, to money launder, etc., etc. It does have very little useful application. You can't really spend Bitcoin. If I went into pret a and I said, uh, I'll pay for my tea in Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin moves so much that it's not a good reference currency. So I, I think it's a bust waiting to happen. But on the other hand, my friend who's been in it, uh, binary.com, uh, has been completely right, and it's up 13 times this year so far. And he's been dead right. I would never have thought that. I wouldn't still be working if I put my money into Bitcoin <laughs> at the beginning of the year. <laughs> so we are going to look um, forward to the new application of blockchain, which you know seems to be uh, the next uh, big technology that is going to throw, um, is going to completely change the established system and their associated power. I mean, we saw online PLC when they announced the change in their name, the share price went up uh, 400 percent, you know, and they haven't even released a news flow. So that's kind of... Well, they don't uh, have anything as far as I yeah. can see. I mean... Uh, they still need to go through shareholder approval, but it, it's just so indicative in how... Um, speculative it yeah. is. So, I mean, good on Dan for getting involved with that. That's all I can say. But... Um, uh, the blockchain is an efficient way of maintaining an open source ledger. Bitcoin is a very inefficient form of money transmission because the costs of trans transmission are extremely high Expensive, yeah. and electricity consumption is huge. I don't know if you know that the miners of Bitcoin today are using as much electricity yeah. as the whole of Switzerland. That doesn't make sense then to do a small transaction, you know. It's $44 per transaction. So you either do a big one or you don't do it. Yeah. 
But everyone's jumping into it. My brother-in-law said, oh, I bought on Friday and it's up to £3,000. I put £1,000. I'm thinking, this is nonsense. You know, when everyone's in it, something's wrong. Probably would be like the dot-com boom at some point. It is like the dot-com boom, but at least some companies came out of the dot-com boom and were yeah. very successful. I think it's going to be like that in lithium, uh, or it's going to be like that in longevity. There'll be plenty of companies that will go bust or fail or be charlatans or whatever. In, in uh, Bitcoin, I think it's only one way, and that's one day it's going to go down, it's going to go down a big way. And if you look at the chart, the South Sea bubble, the Dutch tulip bulb craze, all the manias that have occurred in the world in the last 500 years, Bitcoin is tracking them very, very closely, and it looks like it's very close to the top now. So I would get out if you have Bitcoin. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. My it's pleasure, been a pleasure to, to have you, and always, you know, very, uh, it's an education <laughs> as well. So uh, many thanks. This is everything for the Financial Fox. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.